The purpose of the Global CFO Council is to provide an educational and networking forum for senior financial executives in order to share best practices, discuss current financial issues, and to learn about current topics related to the performance of their jobs. I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and they are yes or no <laughs> answers, okay? Or this intro is going to go like two hours, and you have a presentation. Oh, and I'd like <clears throat> to start by saying, uh, Justin and Michael, you're super interesting. This is unusual. <laughs> Whenever I do a, a cyber talk, the cyber pre presenters, when I when I try to find information about them on the internet, there's like nothing. <laughs> they're boring and they're stale and they've like scrubbed the edges of the earth so there's nothing to find. Um, I can tell right now, Jennifer did not give you a heads up about how my bios go. So I don't read your bio, I find stuff on the internet and then I reveal it to everyone while you're having to sit there and stare at me. So, Justin, I think you live in Chicago. You're a partner at EY in cybersecurity. Is that correct? Yes. Past winner of the EY Chairman Values Award. Correct. Very impressive list of volunteer activities that you're involved with, uh, both yourself and with your wife, including scholarships that you give away to students. I'm not reading it all because it'll make me feel bad about myself. You're also a professor at Indiana University, somehow at the same time as being a partner. Correct. A founder of Progressology. It's my blog. A tech investor. Uh, you also have a connection with Indiana University, goes back to school. I think you got your undergrad in accounting and information systems from Indiana University and an MBA in the same thing from the same place. That's right. So if the whole IT thing doesn't work, you got accounting to fall back on, which I think is it's a good strategy. <laughs> We've got a bunch of tech certifications. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, this is the interesting part why I have the picture up. Um, and I have a bunch more stuff, but I'm cutting it off, all right, because uh, Michael is also very interesting, is uh, um, you're a drummer. Like uh, back in, I think, like, I saw stuff on from marching band to jazz, Latin, rock, and is this true or not? Were you in a corporate rock band and did you win uh, in this, the band name American Pie, P-I? Mm -hmm. That is so, true. That is true. I, I think this is the band. Is that correct? That is the band. That and is the I, band. I think it's also cool. You guys won the, the rock band. Is that right? We did. We won the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Fortune Magazine, Corporate Battle, the bands back in 2011. Wow. That is very, <laughs> very impressive. Um, very cool. And I think your wife is a guitarist. Is that true? She is. She is. We're, we're both very rusty, but uh, but yes, we're both musicians. All right. Well, Justin, you can share again and we're going to we're going to move over to Michael. OK, uh, perfect. Michael. Uh, so let's start with Michael. Have you ever heard the song that I played at the beginning, uh, like my at Mike song there at minute when I would right at eight o'clock? Have you ever heard that before, sir? I I have heard that song before. Yes. Yeah, that was Michael. Michael is <laughs> an amazing artist. Uh, let's start with like what you're here for. OK, so senior manager at EY uh, Technology Risk. Um, and I think before that, Michael, you were a missionary trainer. Is that correct? Uh, that's true. Yeah, I taught taught theology, taught Spanish language. And uh, M I S M at B Y U. Is that correct for your undergrad? That is correct. So in M I S uh, degree. So I think you're like certified everything. Is that correct? Uh, I I at least have one certification. I I don't know what else is out there, but. So this is the call to action, everybody. Uh, Michael is a singer songwriter. That was uh, Hang a Black Cloth. It's worth a listen. On, it's available in every platform. And uh, I like the live version on YouTube. That's probably my favorite. Uh, I think you, you do a little folk, country, blue ga brass. When I, where I grew up, we'd call you Southern Rock. Um, and I also really liked that you look like you were a high school student, but Engines of Commotion, the ping pong song. I also found uh, that. And uh, you were uh, a little thinner. Uh, and it, uh, It's true. Uh, but that was an awesome song. So that's also worth a listen. After this event, I don't want to see anybody dropping off <laughs> or multitasking and uh, watching the ping pong song while this is going on. Because Michael and... Justin have some really important things to talk about. Am I correct? 
Absolutely. We're going to do our best. Well, I think yeah. the most important thing is that although uh, Jessica and Jennifer are on one of these intro slides, because of time, I am not going to reveal their deepest secrets to the rest of the group, and I will yield the mic. I'm going to mute myself. And uh, for now, Michael, I'm going to mute you, and we're going to let Justin kick us off. Perfect. This was officially the best intro I've ever had, Robert, so thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I, gosh, I, I don't know how to follow that, but um, I, I, will, I will do my best. Um, as, as Robert said, my name is Justin Grace, a uh, partner based in Chicago. It, part of the intro that, that he didn't cover, I, I lead our global and America's cybersecurity strategy, risk, compliance, and resilience practice. Uh, we focus on everything from assessments all the way through cybersecurity transformation. So happy to be with you here this morning. Um, I'm joined by Michael Hinckley. Uh, Michael, do you want to quickly introduce yourself beyond the, the amazing intro that you already had? And Michael, I think you may need to unmute yourself. Okay, we will come back to you, Michael. No problem. Do we hear you? No, Michael. that was me. It, okay. Uh, let, let's just move on. And I'll okay. Unmute. All right. Perfect. Michael, we'll come back to you. And as and as Robert said, we're also joined by our local South South Carolina market leader, uh, Jessica Dunnan and uh, Jennifer Walker. So thank you again for this opportunity to speak to all of you this morning. What we're going to talk to you about is uh, three three meaty topics related to cybersecurity. It's um. It's a, it, it, this is a changing topic and a dynamic topic. So we'll take questions along the way and, and I'll be monitoring the chat and, and, and looking, at, uh, looking at your questions. Um, we've got quite a bit to get through and, and, and not a ton of time. So I will offer up any, any follow on conversations uh, you like to, to dive deeper into any of this, any of this stuff. What we'll do is we'll give a, a, a recap of today's security landscape. It's a changing landscape, and we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at the environment in which we're living uh, in the security arena. We'll talk about five common themes in the cyber program assessments that we do. A as a firm, we conduct thousands of security assessments all around the globe, and I've picked out five common things that we see as recurring themes over and over again in these, uh, these assessments. And then we'll, I'll turn it over to Michael, who will talk about the cybersecurity maturity model certification, uh, this, or otherwise known as the CMMC, very important for companies who are doing business with the Department of Defense and the federal government. And we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so let's dive right in and talk about our landscape. We think about cybersecurity and where we are today uh, as, a, as, as sort of a digital business, we are living in the age of state-sponsored attacks all the way to the right. But it didn't start there. It started in somebody's basement. The threat was script kiddies. They were also known as unsophisticated attackers. And why did they do what they did? It was the, for the same reason that we took apart our parents' stereos when we were younger. It was experimentation. It was nuisance. It was notoriety. But we quickly learned that if we applied that same craft uh, to people who had resources, we could extort money, we could embarrass people, we could uh, get po political, social, or push political, social, or environmental causes from sophisticated attackers. We then moved to the age of insider threats, malicious insiders who uh, used company resources for revenge, for personal gain, for stock price manipulation, for, for money, or for competitive advantage. This was also the age where access was out of control. As, as companies uh, grew their networks and grew their resources, people were trying to see what they could do. Uh, and so we saw a lot of trade secrets and company secrets leaving the environment of the corporate networks. Just as that was was coming into fashion, organized crime uh, took hold. This is where we're seeing criminal networks and the ransomware groups that we've seen a, a huge rise in uh, lately. Now, the line between organized crime and 
state sponsored attacks has become extremely blurry because we don't yet really know behind many of the criminal groups where their funding comes from. And so when you hear about ransomware attacks and when you hear about some of the destructive attacks that are are making news headlines, it, it it's it's unclear as to whether or not they are funded by nation state actors or they are uh, criminal networks that are just doing it for the purposes of, of money and gaining resources. But we are living in the age of state-sponsored attacks, and there's an acronym there called APT, and that refers to uh, nation state actors. It's, a, it's an acronym that stands for Advanced Persistent Threat, and that's they're very intentional words. The threat actors that we're dealing with have a lot of resources, they have a lot of time, and they are doing it for a reason of extorting uh, money and resources and gaining competitive advantage. Uh, and you know, one of the biggest things that that uh, that worries me uh, about all of this is that fundamentally, companies have not been able to keep pace with the threat that threat actors have have increased their efforts. The controls that companies have built into their environments have not been able to counter the attacks, uh, and so it, you know, they're, and, and the government we've seen has not been able to step in to provide the resources necessary to counter them either. The only answer in the meantime is to build strong security programs, and that's one of the things that that certainly we help our clients do, and we see the leading organizations do. So the data that I'm, I'm showing you on this slide is, is, is interesting. This represents uh, the publicly reported cybersecurity breaches starting from 2004 all the way to 2021. And the uh, gray line represents the number of records lost if it's been disclosed, and this is all public data. The, the 2013 to 2016 represented the age of exfiltration. You'll notice that the that the gray line is, is pretty high, especially in, in 2016. This is when threat actors focused on getting records, getting credit card information, getting health records, getting personal data. This was when we, we received a ton of letters and credit monitoring from companies. This was the age of exfiltration because we had a duty of care to protect the records that left our company that, that we were trying to uh, trying to keep from, from, from attackers. 2017 represented the first publicly reported ransomware attack, and that is what I've termed the, the age of extortion. We could just as easily call it the age of destruction because in the process of extorting, the, thre the uh, threat actors have become far more destructive in their attacks. They've deleted core systems, they've deleted backups, they've deleted transactional systems, they've deleted data that they knew to be unrecoverable for the purpose of making their extortion attempt far more effective. And by the way, it has become far more effective. We've seen um, cyber insurance premiums rising, and we're going to see them rise 20 to 50 percent. Uh, and at the time that I wrote this, uh, that's that's what we're seeing. But we we expect them to rise far more significantly than that. Worse yet, insurance cyber insurance companies are um, have just announced. Uh, AXA was the first to announce that that they are not um, going to allow those payments to be used to pay. Um, uh, cyber criminals. They will allow the payments to be directed towards remediation efforts and recovery efforts, but not towards the ransom, which is which is a notable change. Uh, they're trying to make the uh, company targets that they're insuring uh, far less attractive. The data that I'm showing you here is 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 interesting as we reflected on on our experience over the past year. The shadow investigations. Now, shadow investigations are the investigations that we perform as external audit companies uh, over our audit clients when they experience a breach. It's fundamentally to make sure that the financial systems are still reliable and that the threat actors didn't compromise the systems that are producing financial results. Our shadow investigations have increased five fold since 2020 and predominantly it's due to ransomware and business email compromise attacks. Those, they make up far and away 62% the largest uh, numbers of, of uh, breaches and investigations that we've that we've discovered. A couple of trends uh, companies are paying the ransom. 
and this is different than than you know, pre 2020 where the the calculus to pay the ransom was a little bit uh, you know hit or miss uh, we found that there are significant gaps in resiliency and a big disconnect between what the companies think they can recover and what they're actually able to recover uh, one of the key things that we found is that the backups are on the same network or same domain as the primary systems so that when a threat actor compromises the domain controller or the the system that provides access uh, to the systems uh, then they get access to everything a large majority of the attacks focused on windows uh, it doesn't mean that linux and mac environments are immune but they but, but windows active directory was a primary source of of the attack um, insurance covered coverage was a large factor in the in the calculus to uh, pay or not pay the ransom, which is why the uh, the insurance company decision to not be able to, to use those funds to pay threat actors is so significant. Uh, theft of old and unstructured data is is increasing. So a lot of the shared drives, the things that people use to collaborate, you know, sort of pre Office 365, pre SharePoint, that exist in your environment that either may have been forgotten about or haven't been archived or taken offline, was a big source of the attack. And so what we see a lot is exfiltration of shared drives, uh, and then the threat actors will use that as a means of extorting funds if the ransom is not paid. Strong monitoring and expedited response was key. If you can see it early, you can intervene and put controls in place before the malware is detonated in the environment, which is key uh, to, uh, to being proactive. So those are some of the things that we're seeing in ransomware. Business email compromises when a threat actor gets into your email system and either uses it to uh, direct uh, payables, switch routing of payables, receivables, or payroll. Uh, they may uh, write an email or call into the help desk and say, hey, I'm a vendor, I've got a new uh, bank account number, can you please switch the, uh, switch the, the routing number or the, or the, and the account number? Uh, and that's highly effective if you can get into the email system because you can make yourself look like an authenticated user. Uh, some of the suspicious geographic monitoring and email box rule detection also helps. So if you're seeing things come from suspicious countries or countries with uh, higher prevalence of fraud, that's a, a good indication. I'm going to go quickly past the next few slides because it's it's more of a admiration of the problem. But I think that as we divided up our shadow investigations across industry, 48% uh, you know, comprised health and life sciences, technology and consumer products and retail. But no sector is immune. Threat actors are opportunistic and they're going to come after whomever they think is willing to pay the ransom, um, which is, you know, spans every industry out there. Okay, so that's the environment in which we're in which we're living, and some of the trends that we're seeing in, in recent breaches. Some of the things that that we see as we go out and evaluate programs that that are critical success factors to good cybersecurity programs, we'll, we'll cover in the next few slides. So before we start, this graphic is what we use to evaluate cybersecurity programs. Uh, we'll send this this material out, so you'll have access to all of this. So you, you don't need to take copious notes. This is this is our framework that we use. It's mapped to NIST. It's mapped to ISO. It's mapped to all the leading frameworks out there. But you know, everyone has to have a framework and a checklist that they follow to to tick down that list. So as we dive into what we see as we do the reviews on that list, the, the first thing is companies are relatively good at coming up with strategy, assessing risk and identifying that risk and then building the roadmaps to, to address them. And I say relatively because there's varying ranges of maturity, but most companies are, are good at aligning to NIST, the NIST cybersecurity framework, which is free and available at, uh, at the NIST website. They're good at coming up with that, that risk exposure and then coming up with uh, remediation projects. What they're really bad at, and, and you may nod your head in violent agreement or, or shake your head in disagreement, but this is what we see when we talk to, to CISOs and, and review cybersecurity programs, is that CISOs are generally not good at alignment, satisfaction, and engagement. 
One, aligning to the objectives and the goals of the business. Oftentimes they're protecting things that don't matter to the business. They're protecting the old stuff, the stuff that needs to be retired. They're protecting things that, that don't, that just aren't high value assets or critical business assets. Engagement. There's a, there's very little, there's very few good structured mechanism for communication, for bi-directional governance channels, for performance reporting, right? And, you know, one of the, one of the telling features is if I need to engage the security organization, how do I do that? Do I call Joe, Bob, and Steve? Do I email the helpline? Do I call in? Do I uh, go to a portal? What is the mechanism to track that engagement from initiation all the way to conclusion? And then finally, satisfaction. Measuring satisfaction is key, and, and, and oftentimes CISOs don't want to hear how satisfied the user organization is with them because they know what the answer is going to be. We promote this constantly because without that kind of feedback loop, it's never going to improve, and we just don't see that mechanism being built in. Okay. Security architecture must shift everywhere. If you've heard the term shift left, what that's referring to is securities, cybersecurity's desire and need to shift deeper into the product development life cycle or the software development life cycle. Shift left being go earlier into that life cycle. I don't think that's good enough. And, and what we typically see is that security architecture or cybersecurity in general needs to shift everywhere. They need to shift north to management to get the funding, to get the, the resources, to get the support, and to get the tone at the top. If it's not important to management, it won't be a, a, um, important to the company. Right? It has to be shifted north. But funnily enough, CISOs, we find, are notoriously bad at communicating in terms that the board and executive management can understand. We see it getting better. We see it um, them being forced into this role, but it is uh, historically been a problem. They need to shift south. Vendors, third party, and supply chain, the supply chain ecosystem. We saw it with Solar Winds. We saw it with uh, with Microsoft. We've seen it with a number of different companies out there that supply chain attacks, vendors, and third parties are going to continue to introduce vulnerabilities into our environment. So shifting south or shifting further into your supply chain and third party ecosystem is is critical. Of course, the engineers, product managers, and customers, and sh the whole notion of shift left is continues to be important. But then we shift east or shift right, the regulators, the public policy community, in understanding what the re requirements and the regulations and, and uh, the, the legislation says and bringing that back into the organization to design a set of controls that are baked into the program. So this notion, this this compass, as we've, we've We've termed it that cybersecurity needs to shift everywhere. It's not sufficient to just shift left. So we talked a little bit about the third party uh, and, and the supply chain and the vendor ecosystem. One of the other things that we see is that traditional third party risk management, TPRM, or otherwise known as vendor risk management, does not protect against supply chain attacks. So I'll take you just through a simple example. This is the company and it identifies a business need, decides to, decides to procure software or services from a third party. So the vendors compete and eventually a service provider is or solution is selected. Sometimes even the, um, the, the security of a company factors into the selection. After they're decided or while they're being decided, the vendor security questionnaire is submitted by the company to the, to the vendor. The vendor completes the questionnaire and submits the required evidence, certifications, and documentation. Sometimes that, that certification and documentation is looked at, sometimes it's not. And the vendor either passes or fails the evaluation and remediation and, and mitigation is, it may be required, it may not, usually is. But after a period of time, especially if the business is really hot on what this vendor is providing and what the solution is, the vendor moves to the contracting process, the vendor is engaged, and work begins. This cycle is, is 
the traditional cycle. This is just what happens, and this is the way that it was done and, and, and will forever be done, and that's fine. But this will not protect you from the supply chain attacks that we saw in, in solar winds and, and will continue to see. On the right, what you see is a basic hygiene checklist. This needs to be done. This is all the traditional stuff we talked through. You need to have a complete vendor list. You need to have good procurement shadows. You need to watch out for shadow IT procurement, vendor tiering and evaluation, evidence, documentation. All these things needs to continue to be done to evaluate the vendors in a variety of different dimensions. You still have to ask the questions. You still have to request evidence. You still have to evaluate them. But the parts of the, the example that don't uh, that, that where it falls down from a solar winds or a supply chain attack perspective, questionnaires and certifications do not equal code or solution testing. That is so critical. Just because you have uh, you contract with a vendor and they have legal liability and they say they do code testing or solution testing may not mean that it's adequate and may not mean that they even do it. And so you have to do it and you have to enforce that they do it. Ongoing testing, both periodic and triggered testing um, is far greater than point in time evaluations. So that the, the process that we saw below is generally done at a point in time, but it's it's very rarely done at a trigger point or or um, or periodically, especially as the nature of the vendor relationship changes. A proof of concept evaluation is very different than a full scale deployment of a system. And oftentimes companies don't go back and evaluate the risk of a vendor when you're going to implement the full thing. The third aspect is if vendors do not test their code and solutions uh, with each release, not just at a point in time when they when they implement it, but with each release, you must. And if they do, you should probably do it anyway uh, and run their releases through some sort of testing cycle, either code testing or release testing or smoke testing, a number of different tests that you can do before that release is put into the environment. That would or potentially could have uh, stopped some of the supply chain attacks, although they are becoming more sophisticated. And then finally, nth parties, and I was going to put fourth and fifth parties, but it really is the whole supply chain. Vendors of vendors pose just as big a risk as the primary vendor. Okay, I know that's a lot to take in, but we're getting to, to number four, and this is my favorite slide because my graphics uh, team likes to put in animated, animated GIFs to, especially for these early, early morning presentations. <laughs> so, Greater visibility and enhanced monitoring of your environment does not necessarily mean a better response, but it could. So we are in an age where security operations centers uh, are sort of fall into two categories. You either do it yourself or you outsource it to somebody else. And we are constantly feeding those security operations centers feeds and data sources and, and things that they need to monitor. With IoT, with the sensors that are coming in, with manufacturing environments, the number of feeds that we are going to send over to our security operations center group is increasing exponentially. That doesn't mean that they are going to be any more effective in being able to detect an attack. Oftentimes what we see is a lot of noise coming out of the security operations center. Um, and, and, you know, a few things to just to, to be aware of. The depth and breadth of the monitoring scope is key. How you define what the security operations center should be monitoring is very, very key. They don't need to monitor, monitor everything, right? And that's just impossible. But key systems, high value assets, um, specific uh, systems that need to be correlated you know, the classic one is if you see somebody log in from Chicago and then quickly badge in from a um, over in China or India, that's an indicator that something could be amiss. It could be right, it could, you know, based on how your network's configured, but it could be amiss and it's worthy of investigation. 
a business stakeholder integration and system ownership. There's so much time lost when a system has an alert that comes up in tracking down the system owner so that they know what to do with it. And so understanding the matrix of who owns which systems, what do they do, which business processes does it tie to so that you can take an effective response is really, really key. Oftentimes that's reflected in playbooks and that's great, but making sure that those playbooks are up to date is, is absolutely key. We talked about OT and, and for those of you who are in the manufacturing um, business, this is essential. I talk to many clients who say we're protected because we air gap our systems. It's not connected to the network. Um, it's not connected to any of our, our transactional systems or our enterprise systems, or it's a separate network altogether. And therefore we are, we are safe and secure. That may not be the case. Um, in most cases where we perform testing of, of, of OT environments, we can either get in uh, through alternate means or trusts between networks uh, or get into the network itself directly. So it, the OT environments are notoriously bad because we don't keep them up to date. Oftentimes you can't patch them, you can't keep them up to date. And so that that is a, a big area of focus for many of our manufacturing clients. Threat hunting and active defense. This is the these are the things that as threat intelligence comes down from the various sources as to what's out there, actively going hunting within your environment uh, for these threats, um, actively seeing what you can exploit and, and proactively fixing them. You could do this with you could do this in the downtime that your uh, security operations center staff have. Uh, but this is a critical function of being proactive to find those threats. Alert qualification investigation. We see one of the, the big things that we see is that um, at the time that the, the uh, SOC lead, the security operations center lead goes to bed from the time they wake up, they usually have thousands of emails in their inbox, which generate a lot of noise and false positives, really making sure that your security operations center focuses on the critical things. SOC playbooks and communication protocols. We talked a little bit about that, making sure that those are up to date. The handoff between the security operations center or MSSP, managed security services provider, is really, really essential. We see a lot of breaches fall down between what the SOC is detecting and the handoff between them and the company. And there are hours, days, or sometimes no time, no, no action taken at all between that action cycle. So really making sure that those handoffs are really, really effective. Uh, email is not sufficient, right? Email notification, hey, we are seeing an alert, we're seeing some uh, suspicious behavior happening, sending it off to a business owner or a lead investigator or somebody to take action. It, what if that person's out of office? What if that person left the company? There has to be an escalation uh, protocol until positive confirmation is received on automation versus manual processes. And I just say this because we know that the number of feeds and the number of devices in the environment is going to increase. This is not gonna be solved through human intervention and there is no amount of people that we can allocate to watching eyes on glass and looking at alerts. This has to be solved through automation and artificial intelligence because we need to be able to take automated response to these things. Okay. The last and final observation, and I could I could have gone on in every single domain of the model that I showed you, but the last observation I thought this group would 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 especially uh, appreciate, and that is cyber reporting metrics and dashboarding are missing some critical elements before we can elevate cyber maturity. So CISO is notoriously good at showing a lot of data regarding the vulnerabilities in the environment. And they're actually pretty good at explaining the, the, the peaks and the valleys. Hey, we had a bunch of vulnerabilities, we rolled out a bunch of patches, and it goes up and down in this never-ending cycle of vulnerabilities and patches in the environment. But what the heck does that mean? The, the model that you see is the typical model that, that, that exists in most companies, where you have your source systems, the, these could be your ERPs, your manufacturing environments, your laptops, your computers. They feed the security tools that, that are monitoring them. Then that feeds a data lake or some sort of model that can perform correlation or generate the KPIs and KRIs that ultimately the CISOs are talking about. 
but it is missing a key element that this group needs to challenge your CISOs and your, your security officers on, and that is the infusion of business context information. So if we take our, our vulnerability management example, what vulnerabilities does that apply to? Or what parts of the business does that apply to? What assets does that apply to? If we see a huge spike in vulnerabilities, does that relate to our manufacturing environment, our customer facing systems? And we need that business context. Uh, who owns those systems? Now, I can't blame the CISOs for this entirely. Sometimes that, that information doesn't exist in a nice, neat place to be able to report and pivot on it. But to the extent that it doesn't, it needs to, that needs to be a focus. Because we'll, the CISOs will never talk in business language if that translation table doesn't exist. Persona and audience definition. The notorious thing I see is that CISOs are presenting detailed information to the board and their eyes glaze over and they just don't understand it. And so really paying attention to who we're talking to and, and crafting the message so that it, it meets the persona and the audience uh, that we're presenting to, right? We communicate to our peers uh, in cybersecurity and to the business owners of these systems very differently than we do the board and the executive team. Uh, reporting visibility and governance, making sure that the reports go to the right people and that they have the authority to make the make the necessary decisions, right? So if we see a system that has unacceptable amount of vulnerabilities or a vendor with an, ex, an unacceptable amount of, of issues, being able to route that to the right place so that that gets the right visibility and attention. To, to the same point of, as persona, making sure that these, these charts and graphs get interpreted in plain English and in plain language, right, is, is putting it into terms that we can all understand. Accountability for KPIs and KRIs, it's, it's great if you display something, but if nobody I can look at that and say, I own that, I, I, I need to make sure that that KPI is managed within tolerance, it's, it's useless. And then finally, the, the sort of the panacea of metrics and reporting is historical trending and future predictive modeling. We're really good at, at displaying past data. What we're really bad at is saying, hey, if we see a spike in quarter end close of, of, of attacks or vulnerabilities, or if we are, uh, which is a real thing, we generally for companies that are approaching a transaction, uh, either a, a merger or divestiture, we, we generally see external attacks increase. Uh, being able to put uh, protective controls in place, if we don't know what they're going after and we don't have that kind of visibility, we'll never get to predictive modeling um, based on the historical data that we're seeing. Okay, so I went through this extremely fast in an effort to, to try to give you a, a an overview of what we what we see out there. I'm going to pass the mic to to Michael, who's going to take us through the CMMC, and there's going to be a lot of common themes that you'll see uh, between CMMC and some of the, the um, uh, common security uh, observations. Guys, All right, yeah. Michael. Oh, go ahead. Robert, yeah, go ahead. Robert. I'm going to hit you up with some questions here. Sure. Justin. We've got 10. I'm going to take two or three just for time so that we give Michael time to shine. Uh, in no particular order, Justin, if you go back to slide uh, six, there was a question around the percentages of attack, either by number attack or impact of attack. Um, Sorry. There was there a slide go. that spoke to maybe four. Uh, you know, now in 2021 and, and sort of the near future, um, this, this count and records lost or impact, how would you break that up uh, slay with the slide before it, where you broke up sort of the four types of actor. It's a it's a great question, and we didn't have the data to pivot off of it, so so we 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 didn't. The you know there's there are a couple of interesting observations, and and as I as I talk through uh, this to to a couple of different audiences, one of the questions that they said is, well, 2021 looks pretty tame compared to past years, and I would tell you that one, this is as of April. 
Uh, and we are seeing the trending as we're looking at May and June data come out is 2021 in terms of the count of cybersecurity incidents is going to increase and, and dwarf even uh, uh, 2019. The other question that we typically get on this slide is, doesn't look like there's a lot of records lost. And, and what I would tell you is all of the records that, that are lost or, or are, that, that ha are lost have been lost. There's no amount of credit monitoring that, that can be provided that you don't already have. The primary objective of the attackers is not to, uh, not to get massive amounts of meaningless data. It is to go after business data uh, trade secrets, intellectual property that can maximize the likelihood of paying the extortion. So I think that the that the number of records lost won't ever be at the same scale that we saw of uh, Cambridge Analytica or MySpace or Target, some of the big breaches out there, but we will see um, very sensitive, highly classified data um, continue to be uh, uh, exfiltrated and extorted. Question number two, should you pay the ransom? Is there honor among thieves? Will you actually get your system access back? Oh, what a great question. There is no right answer. And um, I, I will tell you that the that it, it varies. I would not count on getting your system back. Um, it, you know, if you're if you're saying if you're if that is the only answer that you have, and um, and it varies by threat actor. Some threat actors will you know will give you the decryption key, um, and uh, you know it'll be successful in recovery. But you shouldn't count on that being your recovery strategy. Should you pay it? Oh man, it's 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 every company is different. Every situation is different. Um, and as we saw recently with uh, Colonial Pipeline and, and JBS, who both paid the ransom, you know, we're both dealing with, with a highly critical uh, supply chain and uh, gas issues. And so their only option was, in fact, to pay the ransom. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a highly personal, highly individual, um, you know, uh, contextual question. And, um, you know, that's why uh, that's why you should definitely enlist outside counsel and and external help to uh, to navigate that. All right, last question is all we have time for. Slide thirteen is uh, how how would you equip a CFO to quantify these and prioritize and report to the board if they were trying to partner with the the CISO or their IT manager? Quantify alignment, satisfaction, and engagement. I just want to make sure. Yeah, if, yeah. yeah, if you had to yeah. kind of lean into this to the board, uh, how would you recommend, uh, uh, what are some tips and some tricks for a CFO to partner? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a great, great question. So one of the first things we, we do, and I'll go kind of in order when we're, when we're looking at a cybersecurity strategy, is we, we back up and we say, can you show us the business strategy and the technology strategy so we can make sure that we're protecting the things that matter most that are on the highest, you know, best and highest um, use of cybersecurity's resources. So when we talk about alignment, doing a clear linkage between the investments and the initiatives that are on the business strategy and the business initiatives, the technology strategy and initiatives, and then consequently we'll apply the, the same protective measures um, to those things that matter most. So that traceability is a really great way from an alignment standpoint. Engagement is engagement's a good one too, right? You, you, being able to clearly define what are the reporting mechanisms and the way in which the business can engage cybersecurity. If there's not a clear way to do that, or if they kind of dance a little bit, that's an indicator that it needs to be firmed up. And then satisfaction, net promoter score, um, surveys, um, you know, basic um, SLA metrics are really good ones to get visibility to if they don't already exist. Justin, that was fantastic. The questions are piling up, but we're going to move on to Michael because sure. I'm excited to hear what Michael has to say about CMMC. Uh, so, Michael, I'm going to mute myself and and mute Justin and okay. I'll hold questions until the end of your time. Thank you. And can I, can you hear me? Okay. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks for the thumbs up. I really did that just to make myself get thumbs up from you too. But 
Today, I have the pleasure of speaking to you about the Department of Defense Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, which just to keep things short, I will refer to as CMMC from here on out. I wanna cover why this was created, to whom it applies, what is it exactly if it does apply to you, and the timeline um, in which this is being rolled out and, and for compliance. I understand that not everyone today is currently provides goods or services to the Department of Defense, but don't don't tune out just yet. Um, a lot of the principles that I'm going to talk about are very similar and, and overlap some with what Justin talked about. And I think that by adopting some of these best practices, you can strengthen the the security program and optimize it for 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 better performance and, and better reporting if you follow some of these uh, concepts. So I think there's something here for everyone. So the th first of all, the things I want you to understand from this slide first, if you are, or if you will be doing business with the Department of Defense, whether that's as a prime or as a subcontractor, CMMC is a must. Being certified is really becoming table stakes for being able to engage with the government. You will not be eligible to win future contracts without being able to demonstrate your compliance with this framework. Second, an external auditor is going to assess your security program. And if you are not ready for this audit, I think I would predict that it will probably have some surprises or not go as well as you would like. And you do not want any surprises in an audit to threaten your ability to certify and to maintain the contracts that you have with the Department of Defense. Um, third, the timeline for CMMC to roll out is over five years, but this is rolling out now. Um, there are these so-called Pathfinder contracts that have been named for this year, and each year as contracts come up for renewal, uh, they will be incorporating CMMC clauses into them. And so, you know, your uh, your ticket could be called any of these five years. So if you have contracts expiring this year or next year, um, it might not be a five-year process for you. Um, and also, it can take some time to, to really become compliant. And I'll talk about why uh, in, in the coming content. But those are kind of the three things I just wanted to really emphasize above all that. These are table stakes. You're going to have an assessment and the timeline, although it's five years, there's work to do now to become compliant. So let's talk about why, why CMMC. Justin just talked a lot about vendor risk management and supply chain risk. Um, you know, basically the Department of Defense wants to stop the exfiltration of information from its contractor networks. They wanna raise the bar on the existing program. So, um, in the past, they had this program DFARS, and now they're saying which in which companies self-attested, yes or no, we have these controls, we we looked at our own environment. And the addition of this independent assessment is, is a real step up. Um, I think you can expect that, although a lot of the requirements are the same or similar, the, the bar for, for being able to attest that you have them certainly will be higher. Um, so, so Justin spent a number of slides talking about supply chain risk. This is the government's way of managing it, which is ma mandating it basically. Um, so to whom does this apply? So non-federal entities that process, store, or transmit controlled unclassified information or CUI are entities that need to comply with this. So if you make a part or product for the Department of Defense that is not a commercial off the shelf product, you are very likely receiving custom schematics or, or product spec that needs to be protected. And so what is it? it? So now that we've talked about why it exists, which is to protect the supply chain of, and, and protect national defense, um, to whom it applies, you know, companies that are manufacturing or doing things for the government in which they receive this very specific classification of data, which is controlled unclassified information. So what is it? So NIST 800-171 is a control framework, um, and there's also other capabilities that need to be in place. And the more sensitive information that you receive, the more protected that information needs to be. 
um, if, if we look at like a level one, which is, so there's five levels of compliance or certification. Entities that need to have a level one certification, they're looking at just a handful of controls to protect federal contract information, which uh, would be protecting your, your contracting systems, your, um, your, your general ledger or ERP, where, wherever that contract information is being stored. Once you start making custom parts, you, you really jump up to this level three, which is a pretty big jump. Instead of having, you know, a couple dozen requirements, there's 130 controls plus another 50 capabilities that need to be demonstrated. So you can see that there's a, a pretty large jump in, in what happens. And also, the, the, uh, if, you, if you compare NIST 800-171 to NIST 853, the requirements are, are higher. So if you already have a NIST shop, you may not be complying with, with these specific requirements. For example, um, having, you know, uh, FIPS certified encryption or having a uh, U.S. based data center or, or enclave that to support your business with the government. So the requirements get pretty steep, the higher, the higher you go. Um, and I've already talked about, about the timeline. This is already out in the wild. There's a, a number of so-called pathfinder contracts that are out now. And I think that if you haven't already, you're very likely to receive vendor questionnaires from your from your uh for companies that you do business for asking if you are or will be cmmc compliant and to which level and that's because these big prime contractors and and others are trying to figure out who in my supply chain can support my business with the department of defense and um like i said at the beginning th these are really table stakes if you, if you don't have the ability to certify i think that you, you potentially risk your ability to continue to serve as, as a manufacturer or supplier to the Department of Defense or its prime contractors. So let's go to the next slide if we can, please. I'll, I'll be very brief on this. So in, in 2020, um, the National Defense Industrial Association issued a report. And I'll summarize it by saying that what Justin said is, is basically what this report says. We have a lot of companies that are handling data that relates to our national security that are frankly not ready to protect it in a way that is adequate. And we see information exfiltration um, and, and other issues happening. Um, so that's the reason the bar is trying to be raised because we're just not there yet as an industry. If, if you go to the next slide, please. So the next three slides, which again, I know we're almost out of time, so I'll, I'll go very quickly, um, are all about how do, how do we organize our, our organization? How do we integrate? To Justin's point, CISOs have, have a pretty specific skill set, but this really isn't something that should be uniquely owned by the CISO. It needs a lot of institutional uh, awareness and support. Um, when we talk about alignment and protecting the enterprise, you know, once the vision is in place, how do we prevent silos from happening where either there's inefficient compliance or redundant compliance or, or compliance that just isn't working? Um, and, and what's the value? What's the ROI? I think the obvious ROI are the contracts that you're eligible for as you deliver this. But adjacent to that, adjacent to the contracts that you can deliver for the Department of Defense, by strengthening your security posture, you're really enabling your, your entire organization. And um, you're strengthening the security, hopefully, of your entire enterprise and not just for your government segment. Um, although some of the government segment may be more carefully protected than others. So let's, let's jump to the next slide. I'll, I'll spend a minute on this. So uh, Justin had mentioned earlier that, that CISOs Although they have their strengths at reporting certain things, they're not great at, in his words, aligning with the business satisfaction or engagement. Um, and that and that cyber needs to shift north to other executives. When we talk about CMMC, I, I've noticed in my conversations with companies, right now, a very common ask is the CIO has has looked at the requirements for CMMC, come up with a number that they think will cover their their capital expense and operating expense over the next few years, and then brought that to the CFO and said, 
you know, I'm gonna need $10 million this year to create a US-based enclave and to be CMMC certified. Um, and a lot of CFOs are very curious about, you know, is this really what's necessary? Is this what's needed? Um, so they really need to, to get on the same page. And, and there's a lot of parties that need to work together to be able to understand, you know, what's, what's the real investment required? Do we need to do this? What's the ROI? So we recommend having the following uh, individuals as, as part of the process. And I know we're at time, so I won't spend a lot more time on that. Um, but continuing on, uh, oh, go ahead. Someone jump in, Robert. Yeah, I want to. I want to hit you up with a question before we okay. run out of time. I also think you need to put CFO on on that steering committee. Uh, Is so, it not on there? Oops. Oh, should yeah. definitely be on there. Yeah. Get us on the uh, on the team early, then we'll think everything you said was great because we got to be part of the <laughs> part of the process. And the question's a two for around CMMC. One is, do you see in the crystal ball uh, this applying to other federal or state agencies other than the DoD? And then second part of the two for is, um, what about is could this be useful as a framework to non uh, government contractors, uh, if say a mid market firm that's kind of on the journey of an assessment, could the CMMC be used as a framework? Sure. So on May 12th, President Biden issued an executive order, and that executive order was all about strengthening the supply chain of the entire federal government, not just of the Department of Defense. And so, um, and, and also, we we have a, a member of our of our firm who's on one of the working groups for the CMMC Accreditation Board, and is in Washington and and part of a lot of conversations there. We do predict and and believe that this or a similar requirement will be pushed out to other federal agencies and and for those that support them. Um, so that's that's the answer to that. Um, should a company adopt CMMC standards if they are not serving the Department of Defense? I, I think that they would have to have a compelling reason um, to adopt it. And the reason I say that is, is because there are very specific requirements, like having only U.S. citizens working on certain things that a company would certainly have to, I would think, have to have a very compelling reason to, to have that be a, a, a business driver to do that. Otherwise, it seems like it would be very expensive if you already have, for example, an outsource model. Justin, I don't know if you have anything you would add to that. No, I think I think you hit it. Um, absolutely. And part of the part of the reason there that the, the government's going for the supply chain is to make sure that they go kind of further upstream. Uh, what we talked about is, is if they can get vendors of vendors of vendors, then it'll eventually raise the uh, you know raise the 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 water level for everybody. Well, right. this has been fantastic. And I've got about 20 questions that we're not getting to. So I'm gonna provide uh, Justin and Michael's contact information. And uh, Jennifer has been awesome and also provided some additional follow-up content that I think will really help. And a copy of the presentation and a copy of the recording. So I'm gonna send this out to everyone. I have a bunch of call to actions here on my notebook, uh, things I need to follow up with my internal team. Uh, this has been great. Um, and just a couple of closing thoughts. One is that, you know, you don't have to do all this by yourself. If, if you're thinking, boy, I, I need an, a, a system evaluation and a gap assessment, you know, outside firms like EY are perfect partners to come in and do that. Not to the director of IT or the chief information officer, but with the chief information officer. And Heck, this assessment is probably just going to tell you what the IT person has been telling you for two years, but you will pay a couple buck, bucks for it, so it will sound more important. And uh, I, we all get our financials audited, uh, even though I, I have a team full of accountants and CPAs still pay another CPA to audit it. Uh, it's a good idea to have a, a, a cyber risk assessment or have a partner come alongside you if you're on this CMMC journey. Uh, fishing can happen to you too. Sometime over a beer, I'll share my story working somewhere, how a controller sent $14,000 uh, via a wire. Thank God I got it back. Impossibly, that'll never happen again anywhere. Uh, and I'll tell you how that can happen, even though it's totally not supposed to happen 
against every policy and procedure and control. Phishing can happen to you too. Uh, and then uh, I'd just like to say uh, that Michael and uh, Justin, some rock stars, and EY needs to have a campaign about like the, the rock stars of accounting. Uh, just really impressive. And uh, I highly recommend everybody check out uh, Michael's YouTube channel and his music. I'm going to post a link in the comment section on LinkedIn when I post something about this. And all of you like, comment, and reshare. I'll post a comment to my favorite video I saw of Michael's, uh, his live version of that song. So thank you all for participating. Thank you to EY. Uh, and as I started, Jennifer Walker, superstar in Charleston, she's awesome. And if nothing else, she got her husband to attend a meeting. Wow. Goodbye.